everyone, Dr. Chris here, and in today's video, I am once again going to be talking about GIS and geoscience. GIS specifically for geoscientific field operations. Today's video is about symbology. I got a lot of tips and tricks. I got tons of stuff in this video. Make sure you pay attention and stick around. So here we go. All right, here I am back in my home office, and that's right, I am going to be talking about GIS and geoscience from a field operation viewpoint. And today's video is about symbology. Well, it's actually about a few more things beyond symbology, but symbology is very important when I'm going to be talking about in the next few minutes. Now, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of tips and tricks. Now, you don't have to follow all of them, but a lot of them I have developed over the years. So make sure that you take some notes while I'm talking about them. But first, I'm going to talk about why some of these tips and tricks are very important from a geoscience field operation standpoint. Before we get going, make sure you check out geographicinformationsuccess.com to sign up to my newsletter. Also check out my book, Permissionless GIS, double your GIS job interviews now, and check out my spring store, not Teespring store, to get some GIS and geoscience merch. To start off, there are three major things that you have to take into consideration when you're designing your GIS geoscience field operations. These things are, well, actually, technically it's, it's, it's one thing, but it's mostly how are your operations going to look on your maps on a computer, on mobile, and in print. No matter what you do, these all have to mesh together. When you're dealing with GIS and geoscience field operations, you're dealing with people. You're dealing with a lot of different people with a lot of different jobs. And one thing you and one major thing you have to understand is all these people have to work together. That means if someone's on mobile, they have to be able to communicate with someone who's on a computer. That person on the computer's got to be able to, to communicate with someone who's using paper. What this means is if your field team goes, hey, I'm looking at this gray line here, your office GIS team better know for certain what this gray line they're talking about is. You also have to take into consideration that all these people are going to have different levels of GIS understanding from zero in some cases, if you're dealing with a fieldy who just needs to go from one point to another, to a GIS designer like yourself. The symbology that you choose has to be understood by all these people. And I'm going to throw another mix in there. You're also going to have to deal with clients. What this means is that you have to have a symbology set up for your maps that everybody can see instantly, that everybody can talk about, that everybody can communicate directly back and forth to each other about. This way, you're going to limit safety issues. You're going to limit operational mistakes. And your communication throughout your organization will be a lot smoother if you have symbology that everybody understands and it's consistent across, again, mobile, computers, and in print format. I said I'm going to be talking about symbology. I'm actually going to be talking about several other things within the sort of realm of symbology. I'm going to be talking about the color choices of your features. I'm going to talk about the symbology choices of your points and your lines. I'm also going to be talking about naming very briefly. That's in another video as well. That, that pops up a lot for me. Naming has to be very specific. I'm going to talk about layering positions. That's, that's very important. I'm going to show you why. Finally, I'm going to talk about tables, which is important from a versioning standpoint and, a, again, a communication with your field teams standpoint. I'm going to start off by talking about color and it's several considerations that you've got to consider for your features when you're creating them for your maps for your field operations. First is trying to make your colors colorblind safe. I'll show you why. Uh, make sure or at least try to make sure that there are unique colors for each fe uh, feature group. I'll talk about that too. And ultimately it's go with convention. Sometimes, in it's especially in safety cases, you don't want to get creative. You just want to go with what works. First, use colorblind safe colors. Ultimately, what I'm showing you here on the screen, a lot of people can't see the difference in, in these dots that, I've, that I'm showing right here. I was in a meeting once and I had a great map, an aspect map, where it shows the direction of slope in a very hilly area. It's, it's a cacophony of colors. I could see what was going on more or less. And I got to the end of the presentation and I finally 
said to to my uh, to the meeting people in the meeting. Uh, does anybody have any problem with what I just talked about? And the one guy raised his hands and he said, I'm colorblind, I can't see that last map whatsoever. Luckily, we weren't gonna use an aspect map for our operations, but it shows that you've got to take into consideration the colors that you use for your features on your maps. There's a resource online for color safe uh, use in GIS, but again, there's gonna be a problem when you're dealing with different mobile devices, different computers and printing but try to use colorblind safe colors. Next, your color choice. Uh, now, the colors that you choose need to be consistent within feature groups. Uh, for instance, if you have a pipeline uh, with wells, they should be similar colors. Uh, if you have uh, receiver points uh, with respect to surveys and their associated lines, those should be the same colors. This is to ensure a visual consistency of features within your maps. It'll make your field teams easier and it'll make your life easier. Finally, if all else fails with respect to color, go with convention. Color convention allows you to make decisions quickly. Uh, for instance, red means attention, uh, blue means water, and yellow means caution. For safety's sake and for ease of use of your maps, go with conventional color schemes. Now we're gonna look at symbology for each feature type. In this case, we're gonna start off with points, size considerations, clarity of the symbols, very important, especially for your field crew. We're gonna look at lines and some limitations that are, that are currently a bit of a problem in ArcGIS, which may change sometime in the future. Who knows by the time I, this video comes out. Uh, and finally, we're gonna look at polygon symbol choice, which is actually probably the easiest out of all of them. The symbology of your points have to look good and useful on all your devices and in print form for your field operations. If your points are too small, they're too hard to see, and if they're too big, they just clutter up your maps. The symbology choice is extremely important, especially for your field teams. Their job and their lives can easily depend on your choice of symbology for points. Your symbol choice is imperative. You know, I. I know I like the artistic part of GIS and I want to come up with some cool symbols to put on all my maps, uh, but understand this, your details will be lost the smaller your points get. You need to have point symbology that is easily understood. Simple over complex is the rule of thumb for GIS and geoscience field operations. Line symbology is important as well. You really only have a few choices when it comes to what you can do with your lines. Uh, usually thicker and bigger is you know, more important and that, that's pretty straightforward. You can use dashed and dot lines. Just be careful of the spacing so as it does not look like there's gaps in your lines for your mobile teams. There's actually a current big limitation right now and that is the symbology, say for instance, you want to have a railroad line on your map. If you go from uh, from your computer to ArcGIS Online, it'll get downgraded to just a, a straight line. Again, the rule of thumb here is to make sure that it's understood by your field teams first. Next, I'm going to quickly talk about the naming of your features and, well, it should be exactly what the points are. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. I shouldn't just say points, it's also features. It's your lines and your polygons. If it's a road, it's a road. If it's a fence, it's a fence. There's actually a deeper layer of complexity in the naming that has to do with uh, when you're going to ArcGIS Online. I'll probably cover that in a future video. But the names of your features have to be straightforward and exactly what they are. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is layer position. I'm gonna suggest there's only one way to position all your layers, and that is points are on top, followed by lines, followed by polygons. And I'm gonna show you why right here. Here is an example of layer positioning. I've got the my points on top of lines, on top of polygons. Everything is visible, everything's happy. However, what would happen if I first put my, if I put my lines above my points? It interferes with the points. Now, what would happen if I put my polygons above my lines, above my points? Boom, you can see details start getting covered up. Now, of course, you can do transparencies on polygons, but 
in this case, it is way safer to put your features in the order of points on top, followed by lines, and then polygons. Finally, I'm going to talk about the attribute table of your features. Here is a list of attributes, attributes that I like to include on most, if not all my features. I like having a name for each object, a type. This is domained up because if you have, say, a type of road, say it's an asphalt road or gravel road or a dirt road, you can type it up and domain that. I also include notes. That's in case I want to put some notes in about that object within that feature. I also like version control. The version control is important, especially when you're updating various features depending on new information that comes in. This way, someone out in the field can tap on the feature and say, and say, well, I'm this feature is version two, and I will look at it and go, ooh, you've got the wrong map. We're on version three. Next is a flag that's like a zero or one or three. That's just to easily separate some of the features out if you want to for statistical analysis. You can do importance as well. This is domained as well. Sometimes you need to bring people's attention to a specific feature, so you can throw in importance. And lastly, you don't have to do this with all of them. I like doing it to most of my features, and that's included a created and edited by, that's for feature tracking, and a created date and edited, edited date. That is, of course, again, a feature tracking within ArcGIS. As a GIS person, I like choosing my symbology. I like picking out every little thing, every little color that goes on my maps. But I'm going to say right now, from a GIS geoscience field operations standpoint, your opinion as a GIS person does not matter as much as your field crew. To ensure that your maps are effective, to ensure that your geoscience operations are safe, you have to talk to your field crew and the people in the field and ask them what symbology they want. The symbology you develop for your field operations, it's an ongoing process. Somewhere in there, after a few operations, you'll have a nice symbology that everybody understands. But this is where, again, where you're talking to your field crew, you're talking to your field project managers. And they, I'm going to have to say, they have absolute say, roughly speaking, over what symbology ends up on your maps and what symbology that you use on your maps. To recap, you've got to choose your symbology such that it's understood on a computer, on a mobile device, and in print. You have to make sure that your symbology is instantly understood on all those formats. The symbology that you use for your GIS maps for your geoscience field operations is going to be a collaborative effort mostly with your field teams. Their safety and their everyday work depends on your maps. Before I go, make sure you sign up to my newsletter at geographicinformationsuccess.com. Check out my book, Permissionless GIS, Double Your GIS Job Interviews. Now, also check out my Spring Store for GIS and Geoscience merch. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please give me a big thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, add me to your LinkedIn, or even better, share my videos through your networks. Till next time, I'm Dr. Chris. Keep rocking.